call Neil Coyle to move. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's wonderful to see you in the chair. Um, I beg to move that this House has considered the legacy of Joe Cox, the positive legacy of Joe Cox. I, I thank the um, Backbench Business Committee for giving the time for this debate today and the House authorities for use of the Commons, where, we're, uh, where we have the shield to mark uh, Joe Cox. Um, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful to the Honourable Member for Chatham and Aylesford for co-sponsoring uh, this session and for all colleagues here today and all of those who have supported the debate taking place, including the former Prime Minister, uh, the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead, who couldn't be with us this afternoon, but was very supportive of the debate. Um, I think most members recognise the importance of honouring Jo's memory, celebrating the love she gave and her contribution here, a positive contribution which continues today. It's been a long six years since I sat here to listen to a newish friend make her maiden speech, including Joe's immortal line that we are far more united and have far more in common than that which divides us. So much has happened since. Three Prime Ministers, two more general elections, the European referendum and a global pandemic. And we sought this debate some time ago, before the Batley and Spen by-election was even called. Today it is genuinely an honour to sit next to Joe's sister, and I look forward to yeah. And I look forward to hearing her maiden speech from the same place, albeit with a little less hair and perhaps more girth. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the new member for Batley Spen won the seat in her own right. Yeah. I'm sure some did choose her due to the family history, but many more supported her because of the dreadful opponent and the despicable campaign and divisive, aggressive tactics of the vile Galloway, who clearly has more in common with Donald Trump given both have made baseless legal claims about losing elections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As anyone who knocked doors in the constituency will know, Kim is infamous. Yeah. <laughs> I, I campaigned that. I actually got sunburnt in Yorkshire. Which, <laughs> I but, <laughs> but I knocked doors and I found people who've been to the yoga class, no from school, no from work. The new yeah, member yeah. has her own claim, her own story to tell, and I'm sure will make her own massive impact here on behalf of her constituents. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's six years since Jo arrived here with what her husband Brendan called her relentless optimism. Her passions were obvious, her commitment marked, her energy uncontainable. We were both elected in 2015 and took on the organisation some of the socials for our intake of new <laughs> MPs, including on the family houseboat just two days before she was taken from us. One of the planning sessions for that was on the terrace here, but someone mentioned the literal tug of war, it may have been the Honourable Member of Will South actually, but mentioned the literal tug of war outside Parliament from Macmillan. And Joe being Joe, she just disappeared straight away <laughs> to throw her energy and all of her tiny uh, body mass into that <laughs> effort. A memory which I think typified her spirit. Certainly. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for giving way because he mentioned the tug of war. And I thought I'd just share with him that uh, the Chief Whip, uh, the Government Chief Whip, told me only this morning that it was one of his happiest memories of uh, Joe. But you may agree with me, Madam Deputy Speaker, it seems to me it would have been a most unequal contest. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. In, 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 in that horrific moment when Joe was taken, our country was at a crossroads and many of us feared the attack risked uh, opening a seam of division and unleashing more extremism. And uh, I'm, great, I'm, I'm thankful that the great British public saw her murder as a totally monstrous, unjustifiable act it was, and there has been unity in condemning the motives behind it, as well as an extraordinary effort to better support one another, a trait that I think has been even more demonstrable over the last year through the volunteering, the community spirit and the pop-up mutual aid organisations during COVID. Even in London, despite our 7 million uh, people, it, it can be an atomised existence, incredibly lonely for some, but we've seen more people get to know neighbours and support one another through this crisis, further strengthening communities like mine with a greater sense of commonality and solidarity, something Joe championed and would have been pleased to see. And I think we should be capitalising on that spirit, learning from the post-war Attlee legacy of truly building back better after the war. Sadly, I fear we are missing the moment and failing to deliver a post-COVID legacy that benefits the whole country in the way we all still benefit from the Attlee government's creation of the NHS, for example. But today I wanted to flag up not just that Jo achieved a lot in the short time she was here with us, but that she continues to deliver now on the issues she, and values she triumphed in her life of love. As I said, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Member Chapman Ellsford who co-sponsored the debate in, in the spirit of cross-party unity, which I think Jo also exemplified. I look forward to her uh, contribution today and note in advance she was the, not, not, not just the country's first, but the world's first ever Minister for Loneliness. And it's good to see the Right Honourable Member for Sutton Coldfield also here. 
as his government helped ensure that £10 million has been distributed across 14 countries through the Joe Cox Memorial Grant Fund. That support and resource has empowered tens of thousands of women, including supporting over 1,000 women into office, into elected office. Joe is passionate about tackling isolation and loneliness, and the Foundation has delivered a legacy through, in particular, the great get-together events. I have the privilege of representing an area of one of the biggest get-togethers in anywhere in the country. And I love, I, love, I love representing such a positive local community with a vibrant, welcoming nature which makes events so special and successful. And I say events because in 2019, I went to six on the same day, <laughs> including the largest, which sprawls up Redcross Way and Union Street and beyond. And, and I look forward to the more in common borough and bankside activities that are already being planned for next year. Well, I'm hoping to give way. Of course. Thank my honourable friend to give for giving way. And Joe's a friend and a fantastic West Yorkshire MP colleague. And it is such an honour to have Kim now as our West yeah. Yorkshire neighbour. Yeah. But yeah. it's also Joe's values about more in common are also the ones that it is Kim and her family that have championed so much. Yeah. And so we pay tribute to them yeah. too in West Yorkshire yeah. and across the country. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, and well said. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Across the, across the country, some 20 million people have now been involved in great get-togethers, a testament to the positivity Joe helped inculcate. And even in this COVID crisis in June, over a million people participated in a socially distanced get-together. There are, of course, issues Joe would have still been championing today and that we need to step up on in her name and in all of our interests. The rise in online hate and extremism continues in the UK as elsewhere. As former chair of the all-party group on counter-extremism, I'm very aware of the alarming statistics on the growth of prevent referrals about far-right groups. And in the last year for which statistics are available, there were 105,000 hate crimes recorded by the police, an 8% increase uh, on the previous year. Our focus must be on tackling division and hatred wherever it comes from, and including anti-Muslim prejudice and the startling rise in anti-Semitism, a feature of both far-left and far-right groups. And I cannot fail to mention Afghanistan today, as I think Joe would have been campaigning against the abandonment of UK promises to the women and girls now left subject to Taliban rule. Joe would have been highlighting the refugee crisis created by the collapse of the democratically elected government and for our government to deliver more to help neighbouring states, but also to assist more Afghans who worked for our country to reach the UK and escape yeah. harm. Yeah, yeah. And I'm mindful that our country's Afghan failure show, uh, follows the aid, budget cut and abolition of the Department for International Development. Joe and the Honourable Members for Tombridge and Malling and, and the Wirral South wrote an excellent piece on the cost of doing nothing, which remains valid, and I'm sure both will speak, be speaking on that today. Frankly, I'm nervous that the UK looked decidedly isolated internationally, with the US ignoring us and the Foreign Office suggest, uh, suggestion in March that an alternative alliance could be built to replace American forces ultimately led to nothing but our scrambled exit uh, and the capitulation to the Taliban. But uh, the purpose of this debate was to be positive. And before I sit down, I do want to pay some personal respects to some people who have shone an amazing beacon through some very dark times. Through the great get-together events, I've met the Batley Way bike riders who cycled down all the way from Yorkshire to, to Flatiron Square, my constituency, where they finished their bike ride with a pint, <laughs> and, and where they're met by uh, uh, Joan Kim's parents, Gordon and Jean. We've all seen Gordon and Jean interviewed and their amazing spirit. They are two of Britain's finest, and I'm very pleased to see them here today. You are, you are the best of us, and it's a pleasure to have got to know you both. Your contribution to this place is two wonderful, special people, and through them and their service, you have improved our country, and you've, you've provided opportunities the world over. So thank you for sharing them with us. Yeah. Right, I think right, lots of people wanted to speak to this. I'm really looking forward to hearing contributions, so thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for marking the anniversary and the positive legacy of Joe Cox. Yeah. Yeah. The question is that the House has considered the legacy of Joe Cox. I know, called Tracy Crouch. Tracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it was a privilege uh, to co sponsor the application for this debate with the Honourable Gentleman for Bermondsey and Old Southwark, um, who I th thought spoke very much from the heart and, and uh, enjoyed his, his opening speech. Absolute honour, as always, to speak in a debate like this, um, especially one that is this afternoon celebrating the legacy of Joe Cox. Now, I didn't have the good fortune of getting to know Joe, but through my subsequent role as Loneliness Minister, I have had the pleasure, I think, of meeting her sister, the new member for Batley and Spen, and I'm really looking forward to hearing her maiden speech. 
even though I've put mascara on for the first time in months and she's bound to make me cry. <laughs> I have to say, Ms. Speaker, um, the fear for my ankles means that since she joined the House, I've not yet returned to women's football. Um, she has a fearsome reputation and uh, I'm getting far too old to be hobbling around uh, with bandages. Um, <laughs> probably not. Now, I know that uh, in the gallery, uh, her parents, her wonderful parents, Gordon and Gina, are here, and I'm definitely going to give them a big, big squidge uh, after this speech, so they best brace themselves for some crouchy loving. Um, Mr. Speaker, Joe's legacy is certainly, as was actually set out by um, the Honourable Gentleman, is much wider than the issue of loneliness, but it's the one that I'm most familiar with. The commission that was established in her name to continue looking at this issue in further detail recommended, among other things, a minister be appointed and a strategy developed. Thanks to my right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead, I was not only that minister, but we also produced a cross-government strategy within eight months that has provided a template for discussion around the world. It was an enormously humbling experience for me to be that minister. I was the world's first loneliness minister and curiosity in this brief reached all four, four corners of the globe. But this is what Jo did. She took an issue that others had cast a glance at and then catapulted it into the stratosphere. Like many in this house, I'd spoken about loneliness and isolation in older people before Jo herself was even elected. But when she came into this place, she didn't just focus on the stereotype, she broadened it beyond imagination. And rightly so, because loneliness, can, while it continues to plague older generations, younger people suffer equally crippling rates of loneliness, as do young professionals moving to cities for work, or those are isolated through disability, or as Jo herself noted, those on maternity or paternity leave. Why does loneliness matter when it is a feeling that most people will experience at some point in their lives? Well, the reason is that prolonged and extreme exposure to loneliness can seriously impact an individual's well-being and their ability to function in society. As loneliness has been shown to be linked to poor physical and mental health and poor personal well-being with potentially adverse effects on communities, it was a no-brainer that we needed to work through solutions that combat loneliness. The statistics around loneliness will no doubt be quoted a lot today, and they should be. We need them to remain in the political consciousness. Levels of loneliness in Great Britain have increased since spring 2020. Between the 3rd of April and 3rd of May 2020, 5% of people, that's about 2.6 million adults, said that they felt lonely often or always. From October 2020 to February 2021, results from the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey showed that that proportion increased to 7.2% of the adult population, about 3.7 million adults. Mapping trends across the country also shows the types of places where a higher proportion of people felt lonely, often or always, and differences in personal well-being. Areas with a higher concentration of younger people and areas with higher rates of unemployment tended to have higher rates of loneliness during that particular study period. And local authorities in countryside areas also had lower loneliness rates than urban, industrial or other types of area. These latest statistics reiterate what we learned from the preliminary work for the strategy, which was that all our views about who suffers from loneliness were not always entirely accurate. As an emotion, it shows no prejudice. The chief executive fighting battles in boardrooms was as lonely as the retiree missing the banter of the workshop. The difference was sometimes who would and would not seek or receive the support or reconnection that they needed. As the statistics show, COVID has increased the numbers, but many of the solutions that we proposed in the strategy have not been available, thus exacerbating the problem. The Royal College of GPs were amazingly helpful when it came to developing recommendations, in part because they were seeing themselves an increasing number of patients whose interaction with their doctor was because they were lonely. And it was with that in mind that one of the core recommendations was to use social prescribing to reconnect people. And I genuinely believe that in the run-up to February last year, it was gaining massive traction. The pandemic has been a major setback for obvious reasons. And I have one ask of the minister today, sorry, but unfortunately, actually there's actually two. 
Um, but that first ask would be that there is a major relaunch of the social prescribing programme for tackling loneliness. Yeah. We've all seen really good examples uh, of social prescribing uh, initiatives, including myself, in Batley and Spen. And I think actually all of us across this house will benefit, as our constituents would, from making sure that that programme is relaunched. Now, my other ask of the Minister is to join me in campaigning for a wellbeing budget similar to those in other countries in which reducing levels of loneliness would be one target. Now, I don't have enough time in this debate to rant about why a budget based just on GDP is simply not enough, but I will, Mr Speaker, be applying for a separate debate uh, on why our wellbeing should be front and centre of our post-COVID recovery. Uh, and that includes, actually, many of the issues that I think Joe campaigned on. As Minister, and afterwards too, I've had the pleasure of meeting many people involved in supporting those who suffer from differing and often complex levels of loneliness. I've seen brilliant but extremely simple creative ideas such as friendly benches. I've watched men solder and build things in a shed. I've done interviews and podcasts with people around the world, all of which have started with a confession from the other side of the mic that they too have felt severely lonely. I've seen pubs put up signs welcoming people in for a chat and I've heard about businesses who support existing staff with befriending networks and others who help those retiring reintegrate into society. Every time I see a project, hear a story or talk in general terms about loneliness, I personally find it a humbling experience but I recognise that the progress we have made on identifying and tackling the issue is truly leading the world and quite frankly Mr Speaker, we have Joe Cox to thank for that. Yeah. Can I just remind everybody, we're now coming to a very important maiden speech, and we all know about the legacy of Joe, and it's an absolute privilege to be able to be in the chair to listen to Kim Ledbetter. Kim Ledbetter. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you to my friends, the Honourable Members for Bermondsey and Old Southwark, and Chatham and Aylesford for securing this debate today. It is with a huge amount of pride and a significant amount of nervousness <laughs> that I make my maiden speech today. It has been an honour and a privilege to have been the MP for my home constituency of Batley and Spen for 10 weeks now. Although, if I'm honest, like much of the last five years of my life, it has all been a bit of a blur. <laughs> Following the result of the by-election on the 1st of July, after several weeks of running round the streets of the area where I live, asking people to put their faith in me, with not enough sleep and far too much chocolate and caffeine, I quickly found myself on a train to Hogwarts. Sorry, I mean Westminster. But nobody gave me a book of spells or taught me how to play Quidditch. But here I am. I'm sure every new MP experiences the same mixture of pride and responsibility that I'm feeling right now. But as the House does my family the great honour of paying tribute to my sister, I hope members will understand that I mean no disrespect to this place when I say that I would give literally anything not to be standing here today in her place. We have already heard what an extraordinary contribution Jo made to politics in the tragically short time that she sat on these benches. The love and respect she earned across this chamber is a testament to the very special qualities she brought to the job and the kind of person she was. Others are better qualified than I am to reflect on her talents as a parliamentarian. And for me, she will always be many other things before an MP. A compassionate and caring humanitarian, a proud Yorkshire lass, <laughs> a friend to many, including a significant number of those who are sat here today. A loving daughter, and I'm delighted that our parents, Jean and Gordon, are here today. Yeah. <laughs> a fantastic sister-in-law and wife, an outstanding mum to Coolin and Layla, who remain full of Joe's energy, optimism and spirit. And the best big sister anybody could ask for. Joe's murder ripped the heart out of our family. I've spoken on many occasions about my ongoing disbelief and devastation following her death. And it still doesn't feel real, today more than ever. 
And it was devastating for the people of Batley and Spen too, because so many of them had also taken her to their hearts. The constituency has much to be proud of, and I will come on to some of those things. But I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say that we take no pleasure in being known as a place that has had four MPs in the space of just seven years. My predecessors, Joe, of course, but also Tracy Brabin and Mike Wood, and indeed Elizabeth Peacock before them, all made their mark in very different ways. I come to the job, as I'm sure they all did, with a determination to do things in my own unique way. I couldn't do anything else. <laughs> People may make comparisons, and they are, of course, entitled to, but, when I'm very much, but I'm very much my own person, and I will always be true to myself, proud of where I come from, and ready to crack on and get stuff done, no matter how big the challenges may be. Yeah. Batley and Sven have been through a lot in recent years, but time and again, when others have sought to set us against each other, we have come together. When we have been riven by violence or the politics of hatred and division, we have shown the best of ourselves. Generosity, warmth, respect, tolerance and love. Those are the true qualities of the people I am proud to represent. Jo said in her maiden speech that as she travelled around the constituency, she was surprised time and time again by the fact that we are far more united and have far more in common than that which divides us. I believe those words are as true today as when she said them, perhaps even more so. But my sister would never have pretended that we don't have our differences and disagreements, and nor do I. Of course we do. And the world would be a very dull place if we didn't. But we should also have the ability to respect each other's opinions when we disagree. And the good sense to know that our communities can only thrive when they embrace, embrace each and every one of us. And I am very clear that we cannot pick our equalities. Yeah, yeah. I'm Batley and Spen, born and bred. I've lived and worked in almost every part of the constituency. Heckmond White, Cleckheaton, Gummersall, Batley, Liversidge, Staincliffe and Littletown. <laughs> and while the towns and villages that make up the constituency all have their own unique character, of which they are justifiably proud, the problems people face are often very similar. No matter where you live or what your background might be, the potholes in the road are just as deep, the dangers posed by speeding drivers are just as terrifying, and the impact of crime and antisocial behaviour is just as devastating. There are no easy answers to many of these problems, but having had discussions and meetings with literally hundreds of my new constituents over the summer, on Kim's summer tour, <laughs> it's clear to me that we all have a responsibility to play our part in tackling these issues, whether as individuals, organisations, communities or families. It's no good thinking that dealing with these issues is always somebody else's problem. And we should never ignore the importance of family and community and of working together. Across Batley and Spen, and indeed the country, whatever your household looks like, the pandemic has reminded us just how much we need our family and friends and the wider community. For Jo and for me, the values we learnt from our parents and the empathy and compassion they instilled in us enabled us to make a difference in our own ways. And we have seen so much of this in recent times. Our schools and colleges, our churches and mosques, our community organisations and sports clubs and our families and friends have helped to bind us together to face the common challenges we have shared. I'm incredibly proud of the work of the Joe Cox Foundation in this regard. Yeah. Such a valuable part of Joe's legacy. By building a network of more in common volunteer groups and hosting the annual Great Get Together weekend in June on Joe's birthday, the team have worked tirelessly to tackle loneliness and to build togetherness in communities up and down the land. There is something else we have in common in my part of the world. We don't like being taken for fools. So with respect, I say to the party opposite that fine words about levelling up are all well and good. But what we've seen instead in Batley and Spen over the last decade are drastically reduced police numbers, huge cuts to the roads repair budget, growing poverty and inequality, and queues outside our food banks. There are areas of my constituency that are desperate for investment. And I will be holding the government to account 
to ensure that Batley and Spen gets its fair share of whatever levelling up money is going. Yes. So that it goes to the people and communities who need it most. We need new opportunities for our young people, the chance to breathe new life into our villages and town centres, and support for the many excellent businesses we are lucky to have. We need more jobs, but good quality jobs, doing what we do best in manufacturing and services, not huge soulless warehouses full of robots. That is the only way to ensure a bright and prosperous future. That is my vision for Batley and Sven, and indeed the country. Happy, healthy, united communities, working together across the sectors to tackle our problems, supporting each other and celebrating our successes, and where everyone feels included and that they have a role to play. So I look forward to making the case for the people of Batley and Spen as their new MP. We've all had to get used to using technology to keep in touch in recent times, but I'm very much a people person, so I'm pleased that the business of the house is getting back to normal. Yeah. Although I hope with an appropriate amount of caution and without complacency. I'm told that one of the first skills I need to master is bobbing up and down to get your attention, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> And as I have a background in sport and fitness, I hope that's one thing I'll be good at. I might even add a few squats and lunges so we get a bit of a workout. And everybody is welcome to join in, of course. And when I do get the opportunity to speak, it will be an honour to bring a bit of Yorkshire straight talking grit and common sense to the debates in this place. Yeah. Like Joe, I will be happy to work with MPs of all parties in the interests of both my constituency and the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I am grateful to the many members from both sides of the House who have been so generous in welcoming me here. I'm quite new to politics, so I'm the first to admit that I've got a lot to learn. I've already nearly sat down on the wrong side of the chamber a couple of times. <laughs> Although, whilst that might be the wrong side for now, I'm sure that day will come. Yeah. Well, soon enough. I've got lost in the maze of corridors in this remarkable building more times than I care to mention. Fortunately, someone has always helped to point me in the right direction, so thank you if you were one of those people. And I'm sure I'll make more mistakes, because I'm only human, as we all are. And I think sometimes people forget that. Yeah. We all have family and friends, and if we're lucky, maybe even some interests and hobbies outside of politics. <laughs> Putting yourself forward for public office is a brave thing to do, wherever you sit in this place, yeah. and I appreciate that now more than ever. Since my election, the one thing that people keep saying to me is, Kim, please don't change, and I don't intend to. I will always stay true to my roots and identity. If I can be half the MP my sister was, then it will be a huge privilege to get on with the job of representing the wonderful people of Batley and Spen. Thank you. Can I, can I just say, we're all moved. We'll always think of your sister. And I know that you're going to be a great member of Parliament. And don't forget, get involved in that rugby league group as well. <laughs> Andrew Mitchell. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. It's a tremendous delight, indeed a privilege, to follow the Honourable Lady who has just joined us from Batley and Spence. And on the strength of what she's told the House today, no one on either side can be in any doubt that we will all look forward to the issues she takes up and to hearing her, uh, in my case, across the chamber, but in hearing what she has to say, and I know she's going to make a tremendous contribution on behalf of her constituents. It's, um, it's, 32, it's 34 and a half years, Madam Deputy Speaker, since I made my maiden speech in this place, uh, listening, listened, 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 to by, listened to by my father sitting uh, on these benches, and we're all so pleased that the Honourable Lady's parents are here today, able to watch what she has had to say and to see her maiden speech in the House of Commons. She spoke with enormous eloquence about her constituency, but she also spoke so kindly about her predecessors. And I, of course, served first of all with Elizabeth Peacock, who was a formidable uh, colleague. But she follows in that finest tradition of people who are outspoken and forceful on behalf of their constituents. And the whole House will have enjoyed what she had to say uh, today. Now, 
Madam Deputy Speaker, I knew uh, Joe well. I, I first met Joe when I was in Al Fasha in Darfur, in Sudan, in about 2006 with David Cameron. And she was there at a meeting fighting for the rights of women who were then being brutalized and murdered uh, and raped in Darfur. And she was a huge presence then, so long ago. I also remember her for her trademark scarves that she used to uh, wear. And uh, she approached me when she was elected to this House and asked me uh, whether I would join with her in co-chairing the Friends of Syria, which I continue to do with the uh, Honourable Lady for Wirral South. And she came along and said, would, would, I, would I join her and in doing this? I said I'd be delighted. And we worked together very closely in, in trying to deal with that huge humanitarian crisis which saw more than five million Syrians uh, on, on the move. And, I uh, remember so well going with her to have tea with the Russian ambassador, and the Russian ambassador complained that I had said in this place that the behaviour of the Russians in bombing Aleppo was no different to the behaviour of the Nazis in bombing Guernica during the uh, Spanish Civil War, to which the Russians uh, wrongly, in my view, took exception to the comparison. But I will never forget that occasion, because Joe with her principled approach and self-evident decency shredded this experienced diplomat and left him unable to speak. A an episode along with others that I have written about in my book, which is being published, <laughs> uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, on October the 12th, and I'm advised will be available in at least some good bookshops. Now, um, Madam, Deputy Speaker, <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, on the occasion uh, when uh, this House met following the murder of the Honourable Lady's sister. It fell to me to uh, make the main tribute from the opposition backbenches on that uh, occasion. It's one of the most miserable occasions in nearly 35 years I have uh, had in this House. Um, and today I want really to make, in this very short intervention, just two points about Joe's legacy and two things where I think she set us all, where, wherever we stand in the House of Commons, uh, a very good example indeed. The first of those two points is this. On almost any issue that was before us, we would know in advance where Jo stood. And I think that's a very important uh, point. She was someone who was such clarity and decency that whatever the issue, you would know if you knew her uh, where she would stand. She had a brand. Most of us don't have a brand, or if we do, we rather wish we hadn't. But, <laughs> but, but she did, and I think that's something which all members of Parliament should aspire to. The fact that we, our position we take on issues is clear and understandable. And the second point I would make is this. Uh, jo was an example of something the public don't always appreciate about this place, but which sees this place in my view, at its very best, and that is working across party on okay. finding issues where you have agreement with those who may, in many other areas, have a different political opinion uh, for you, from you. And she epitomised the principled uh, clarity of views and beliefs which mean it's possible on so many occasions, not just in uh, select committees or on all party groups or indeed on other ad hoc groupings which this place has in abundance. But it, it, it's one of the best aspects in my view of the House of Commons and one that is, when it comes to light, is most appreciated by our constituents that actually where it really matters we can work together in the public interest, in the interests of those we represent who have done us the great honour of sending us to this place. And I think that the Honourable Lady's speech epitomises that fact and that today's debate is very much about it. Stephen Kinnock. Thank you. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's a pleasure to uh, follow the Honourable Gentleman uh, who really was a true friend and colleague of, of Joe's. We, we do know that and we, we have often talked about her and about her legacy. Also, I'd like to congratulate, of course, the uh, Honourable Gentleman, my, my Honourable Friend, uh, for securing this debate, um, which I think is such an important occasion for us here in this House to reflect uh, on Joe's legacy. But perhaps above all else, I'd like to congratulate uh, my honourable friend, the 
freshly minted uh, <laughs> member for Batley and Spen. I too joined her on the campaign trail in Batley and Spen. It really was quite an experience. I do genuinely believe that Kim personally knew about 50% of every person that we saw, uh, every street and every family that we met uh, in that constituency. And um, we also had a chance to play some football in the streets, which I think was a vote winner. Um, I certainly think it should be counted into to the majority. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity as well to contribute uh, to this debate. I had the privilege of uh, <clears throat> of knowing Joe, I, I didn't realise this yeah, would happen so quickly. Um, I would like to give away, thank you. Just take my mask off. Um, uh, does the honourable gentleman agree with me that everybody in here could understand without question how difficult this is for many of us, but how much we delight in celebrating our friend who we miss so dearly? and uh, everybody would understand that some of us may need a little time in that yeah. Yeah. I thank my honourable friend. I'm not sure whether that's helped me to, <laughs> to pull myself together, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Um, I, I had the privilege of knowing Jo for around 20 years. I shared an office with her for a year uh, before she was so cruelly taken from us. Um, when we were, we were elected in 2016, and uh, I'm still in that same office now. Um, and I can tell you there's, there's not a day uh, that goes by when I don't think of her hurtling into our office in her <laughs> cycling gear, having a chat with my staff and, um, you know, talking about one of the most amazing campaigns that she would be working on. And they were wide-ranging campaigns, from reducing loneliness in society to standing up for refugees, to fighting for the Labour Party's values and Britain's democratic values and compassionate values internationally. Jo was truly driven by giving a voice to the voiceless and by speaking truth to power. If I was really lucky, she would bring her beautiful children into the office. Uh, I'm not sure if they're here with us today. I don't think they are, but uh, it was always wonderful to see them. And, and if I was really, really lucky, I would receive a dinosaur drawing uh, or even get the chance to read them a story. And it's these personal memories of Joe that I continue to cherish most uh, every day. Thank you. Um, I, I knew Joe for a far shorter period than my honourable friend, um, but we were both candidates in the run-up to the 2015 general election in West Yorkshire and we had meetings as candidates and calls and sometimes there were things that the rest of us weren't prepared or able to articulate but Joe <laughs> would always almost read what we were thinking, think the same thing and articulate it braver and stronger than the rest of the group of candidates and you could see that bravery and strength after she became an MP and actually in the legacy and the foundation and what happens now. And we can all learn from that and, and hold on to that as a real strong part of the legacy here in this place. Yeah. Yeah. If I could just say, if at any point the honourable gentleman wants me to go to the other side and come back, just tell me. It's going to be all right, Madam Deputy <laughs> Speaker. It's going to be OK. <laughs> I, and I thank my honourable friend. He's absolutely right. Joe had an amazing, almost a telepathic ability to connect with people, to see, read the mood, uh, read what, where people were going in a conversation, and, and uh, that was one of the reasons that she was such a persuasive person and such a great campaigner. I remember what Jo stood for, her dedication to the values that she held so passionately, values that I hold dear, that the Labour Party hold dear, and I know mem many members across this House hold dear. These values represented the very best of our country, compassion, community, solidarity, internationalism, and a belief that our great country can be greater still. She cared about our place in the world because she cared about the lives of the people that she had committed herself to serving and understood the way that global politics affected the everyday communities in Batley and Spen and across the length and breadth of our country. Jo was an internationalist to her fingertips, 
believing that we can do more good by working together with our friends and neighbours than we could ever do on our own. She wanted Britain to continue to be an open, tolerant and generous country that engages with the world with our heads held high instead of turning our backs on it. She wanted Britain to face the big challenges of the 21st century, from climate change and terrorism to the stresses and strains of globalisation and the impact that they have on our communities, with our eyes and our hearts open and with the strength in numbers that comes from standing shoulder to shoulder with our democratic allies in Europe and beyond. The years that have passed since Joe's death have been difficult for Britain politically, but I've always taken inspiration from the core messages that she sought to espouse through her politics. She was relentlessly committed to unity over division, as encapsulated perfectly by her famous comment that we have far more in common than that which divides us. But she also believed passionately in standing up for what was right, and she always spoke truth to power. She encapsulated, I believe, what an MP should be, viewing our opposite numbers as opponents, not as enemies, never afraid to take on an argument, but always willing to work cross-party if there was an issue where progress could be better achieved by working together in the national interest. Jo worked tirelessly across party lines because she understood that in our complex and interdependent world, that compromise is a sign of strength, not of weakness. Mm -hmm. Jo was a pragmatic idealist in every sense of the term, and I hope that we can honour Jo's legacy by seizing every chance we get to discard narrow party politics in favour of doing the right thing for the communities that we represent. I feel that a great way to honour that pragmatism would be for all sides of this House to make more effort to work together to meet some of the major challenges facing our country today, from climate change to social care. Out of the deep darkness of Joe's death must now come the shining light of her legacy. So let us build a politics of hope, not fear, of respect, not hate, of unity, not division. Whilst we will all but whilst we will all cherish Joe's public legacy, I will also always cherish the private Joe. I'll miss her counsel, her companionship, and above all, her friendship. She was a relentlessly positive person who could lift my spirits after the toughest of days, a true friend who I miss every day that I walk through that office door. But if ever I am feeling low, I just need to look at the example provided by Joe's family, one of whom is sitting on the green benches next to us today. They've shown such remarkable courage and dignity in the past few years. Mm -hmm. To paraphrase Joe's sister, the Honourable Member for Batley and Spen, we will not be beaten, and we must channel all our energy into ensuring that Joe's legacy is honoured. And today I want to end by paying tribute to my Honourable Friend, the Member for Batley and Spen. I'll never stop taking pleasure in saying that. <laughs> she stood for office with such courage given the circumstances. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And she spoke today in her maiden speech with such heartfelt passion about why she has stepped up, why she has taken responsibility, and why she will help us to carry forward the legacy of her sister. I know that she will serve those same Batley and Spen constituents with the same grace, commitment, goodwill and determination that Jo did before her. And she needn't worry. Because whatever happens from this day on, my word, she has done her sister and my friend and this house proud. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, for calling me despite me charging in um, barely a second late. You may think that's because my timekeeping is poor, but actually it was a tribute uh, to my friend Joe Cox, who, in my recollection of working with her, a very brief period, was almost always begun with a crashing door, a burst of colour, and a, I'm sorry I'm late. In those moments when she would burst in, she brought with her, as many have already said, an extraordinary ball of energy, an extraordinary passion, an extraordinary strength, that I'm delighted 
to see has returned to this house in the Honourable Lady for Batley and Spen. She's demonstrated that the family that gave birth to one extraordinary individual and raised her has achieved it a second time. And for that, I pay the most extraordinary tribute to a fantastic, a fantastic mother and father. Now, I'm going to share with you my experience of working with Joe because together we put together almost all of a paper on the cost of non-intervention. Because we'd seen, both of us in different ways, the impact that intervention, military intervention in my case, humanitarian in hers, had had on lives around the world. We'd seen the problems in Iraq, we'd seen the failures in Afghanistan, and we were aware that in many parts of the world, and including in the United Kingdom, there was a desire, almost a hope, that we would never do it again, that we could turn away, that we could look past and pretend it wasn't happening. But we can't. And she knew that. Because what she also brought to this place was the reality of a lived experience of somebody who actually knew the cost, who really saw the price, whether in Darfur or in Syria, who knew what it meant to the lives of the most vulnerable, the most at risk in countries around the world. And so together, we pulled together most of the paper, The Cost of Doing Nothing, which was published by Policy Exchange. But sadly, before it was able to come out, before indeed it was fully finished, we know what happened. And that was a, it was a terrible moment, I'm sure, for everybody. And my memory of it was phoning her number many times. And sadly, like everyone else, getting no answer. But after that, I have to say I pay huge tribute to my friend, the Honourable Member for Wirral South, for the extraordinary courage she showed in taking up the work that had been done, in not imposing herself on it, but ensuring that what was published was in keeping with the words that Jo herself would have written. And in that, I pay another tribute to my friend, Brendan, who is up in the gallery, who helped us. I will give way. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and, and I thank the Honourable Gentleman. While he is heaping out praise, and to refer back to uh, what the Honourable Member of the Royal Town of Sutton Colford had said <laughs> uh, earlier, uh, is I feel that I wouldn't ever wish to speak for Jo or ever claim that I could, but I know what she would think at the moment in the last few weeks, and she would be heaping praise on you for the interventions that you have made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if she and her legacy give you any courage in what you are doing, to know that she is in my eye and my mind standing shoulder to shoulder with you. Yeah. Yeah. I have, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm enormously moved. Um, and as somebody as my girth and size knows, that's quite hard to achieve. <laughs> it's, it has been in thinking of the work that we did together that I have been motivated and, and given strength to speak out in recent weeks because I know that these are not political issues in the narrow sense. These are issues that I think unite the core of our country. And it's in that as well, it's the last point I want to come on to. Because the Honourable Member, the new Honourable Member for Batley and Spen, has already demonstrated that she knows perfectly well how to find herself around Hogwarts. <laughs> she knows exceptionally well how to make her voice heard in this place. And she knows, because I can tell you, how to make friends uh, across parties. In that, she needs absolutely no advice. The one area where I think we all need to remember, and I don't single her out especially, I think it applies to all of us, is to remember what this place is for. Because it's too easy to think of it as a place for sound bites and video clips. 
It's too easy to think of it as a place where we pass a quick bill or make a cheap point. What this place is for is to have the fights that a democracy needs to have, to have the arguments that free people need to express, to test ideas, to challenge each other, respectfully, yes, but to challenge each other, to try and make the best for this amazing country we are privileged to be in. That's hard to remember sometimes, and I admit my own failings. But it's hard to remember when too often the accusations are of immorality or deceit, or the supposition is that parties define individuals rather than are defined by the individuals who make them up. And what Joe demonstrated, and for me, made her not just a great friend, but an amazing parliamentarian, and more importantly, a Great Britain, is that she knew the purpose of this place. She knew it absolutely fundamentally. It wasn't to back down. It wasn't to make cheap compromise. But it was, as my honourable friend, the member for Aberavon, put it, to make compromise from a position of strength and principle, to choose the battles to fight, and to make sure that they were won, but not in a way that ground down your opponents, but brought them with them. And that she achieved. And that she achieved remarkably. And I still cannot believe how brief the period was, but remarkably in under two years. I've been here six years, and I've consistently failed since. But <laughs> she has... <laughs> she demonstrated that, and that is what I try to remember here. So as I pay tribute to a fantastic maiden speech demonstrating all the passion we knew that she had. The Honourable Member for Batley and Spen is taking up an extraordinary mantle and carries with her the thanks, certainly, of this House, and I'm sure the whole country, for demonstrating that courage is that willingness to come forward, even when it's difficult, and particularly when it hurts. Thank you. Alison McGovern. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and uh, it's an honour to follow um, the member for Tunbridge and Molling, and also very appropriate, as will become clear when I continue with the rest of my speech. Um, but before I get to those points, um, I want to thank the member for Bermondsey and Old Southwark and the member for Chapton and Aylesford, who's just popped out from <laughs> her place. Um, for securing this debate. I think it is important that we put on the record the positive legacy of Joe. Um, and it gives me great heart to listen to speeches from across both sides of the House about just what has been achieved um, in Joe's name. Um, I also want to thank briefly the member for the royal town of Sutton Coalfield. I think I've got that right, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, not just for the speech he gave just now, which was excellent, but for five years of friendship, for which I am very grateful. And also the member for Aberavon, who's been dedicated um, in the work that he has done as well. Madam Deputy Speaker, today's debate marks five years since the murder of Joe Cox MP. Then the Member of Parliament for Batley and Spen, and she was a Member of Parliament um, for a short time, but her life had already shown, even before she came to this place, just how much good could be done by a person with a simple determination to serve those in the world who needed her. In the five years that have passed, many people in our country have begun their own journey into public service, inspired and comforted by Jo's words and spurred on by her example. And that is the legacy we record today. Above all else, I must congratulate the new member for Batley and Spen yeah. on her brilliant yeah. by-election yeah. victory and her major speech. Sometimes a win really helps. And <laughs> what a win that was. <laughs> I mean, like the member for Aberavon, like I really can't explain how happy I am <laughs> to describe her as the new member for Batley and Spen. Yeah. I came to know her in the worst possible circumstances, but having made friends with her has been nothing but a gift. 
even when she made me do 1980s aerobics. <laughs> <laughs> and also uh, the women's parliamentary football team. Um, she's her own person, as she said, and she will represent her hometown in her own way. But she has shown a courage over the past five years that is worthy of a sister's love. Mm -hmm. To Brendan, Coolin, Layla, Jean, Gordon, all of Joe's family and friends, I say thank you for all you've done. You have been a light in the dark. Yeah, yeah. To Joe's friends, to Kirsty McNeil, Eloise Todd, Iona Lawrence, Nicola Riendorp, Ruth Price, so many others, thank you. And to Joe's friends here in this place, those who've already spoken and those who will speak, but especially those on the other side of the house. I thank them for showing that those words count just as much on that side of the house as they do on this. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, to everyone in Batley and Spen, thank you for putting up with us during the by-election. <laughs> um, the towns of Batley and Spen are rightly known across the country for the care and kindness they have demonstrated. So today's debate is a chance for us all to reflect. We reflect on Jo's life and the contribution that she made to her own community and to our whole country and the efforts that Jo's family and friends have made on tackling loneliness, the role of women in society and in politics and on the humanitarian imperative. Madam Deputy Speaker, others will rightly talk about Jo's legacy in our country. Now I have seen firsthand in Batley and beyond what an impact she has. Her words have gone on to have very real meaning in every connection made and every friendship built. But Jo's activism echoed not just in this country but around the world, and her loss was felt not just in the UK but in every place in the world where Jo had worked. Her belief in that humanitarian principle that everyone in the world is entitled to the basic protection of their life and liberty led her to meet people from the four corners of the earth, and when she died, they grieved just as we did here. Madam Deputy Speaker, that was why, in 2018, the then Department for International Development established a development grant programme in Joe's honour. It funds women's empowerment organisations and the prevention of identity-based violence. And the Joe Cox Memorial Grants get UK aid money exactly where it needs to be, backing women's leadership and using protection approaches to stop violence before it escalates. Yeah, yeah. That humanitarian principle that Joe fought for is made real by this work. And I want to thank all of the civil servants in DFID, as was, and FCDO now for working so hard to make it happen. And though she's not here, also the member for Portsmouth North, who played a leading role. Yeah. Yeah. In other aspects, however, we, we must all go further. And I have met many Syrians in the UK who spoke with Joe in the year that she served in this place, when she gave voice to the horrors taking place in their country. They miss her now, just as I do. And in truth, life for Syrian civilians has worsened year after year. From Aleppo to Idlib and all over the country, civilians are displaced and forced to live in deep fear for their families. Madam Deputy Speaker, it goes on and on. Joe advocated for a strategy to protect civilian life in Syria. And five years later, that is what we are still crying out for from the international community. Jo spent a decade campaigning for global acceptance of the responsibility to protect doctrine and looking events at events in Syria since she was killed. It is clear that she was right to do so. On Syria, Jo said that we must put the protection of civilians at the centre of our foreign policy and not sit on the sidelines whilst hundreds of thousands more are killed and millions flee for their lives. And she was right to say that. That which Joe feared has happened since, and it's happening right now. The International Crisis Group reported that in Daraa province in the southwest, the regime has, throughout this month, renewed attacks on Daraa city's besieged Al Balad neighborhood, where fighting killed at least 32, including 12 civilians, and displaced 38,000 people by the 24th, 24th of August. That isn't five years ago or 10 years ago. It's two weeks ago. And the UN Special Envoy for Syria, Gia Pedersen, on the 12th of August, warned that civilians face shortages of basic goods and the, the near siege-like situation must end. Ignoring starvation and terror in our world won't make it go away. And as the member for Tunbridge and Morling and I, 
published and the pamphlets that he should have published with Joe, knee-jerk isolationism is not in Britain's interest yeah. any more than it is in the interests of those in the world who need our leadership. All it does is make us look powerless in the world and careless about the international norms that we helped to create. The argument that Joe made in this place that we have a responsibility to use the tools at our disposal, be they diplomatic, development or defence capabilities, to protect where and when we can was the right argument. And it has rung ever more true over the past five years than on the day that Joe made it. However, I believe in the public response to the Afghanistan crisis now, we are seeing Joe's legacy. As Joe said, she had met battle-weary elders of Afghanistan and understood the impact of conflict. When she was killed, then Chancellor George Osborne credited her with changing both attitudes and policy when it came to refugees. He said that she would never know how many people's lives she had changed. And he was right, Madam Deputy Speaker. So finally, in conclusion, let me say this. In Joe's honour now, we all have a duty to see the common humanity we share with those who are the victims of conflict, not of their making. Whether in Afghanistan or Syria or elsewhere in the world, there will be circumstances which cause humans to flee. Our country should be proud of every person who finds safe refuge here, as Joe's friends and family should be proud that her defence of refugees made people think again, mm. and crucially, change the minds of those in power. Yeah. That, Madam Deputy Speaker, is Joe Cox's legacy. Our responsibility is to live up to her principles. Yeah. 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 Danny Kruger. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I, I, will, be, I will be brief. I didn't know Joe Cox. And uh, I, uh, I intrude on, the, on this debate because it is about her legacy. Um, I didn't know her, but I, I, we did have some friends in common outside politics, um, and I had the pleasure of having some contact with the Honourable Lady uh, before the election uh, and with Brendan uh, um, as well. And it, it, it just strikes me that this concept of having friends in common is really what we're debating today, and we're talking about friends in the Commons. And I'm, I'm very struck by everything that's been said about her. M much was new to me. My uh, impression of her, uh, having had some uh, working with the, 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 the foundation after her death, uh, is of someone who worked very deliberately uh, to, 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 to cross divides, to build bridges, and to uh, live up to her statement that we have more in common. And I just wanted to reflect briefly on that phrase and wonder what it actually means. What is it that we have in common? What is it that binds us together? And without presuming to speak for her, but from listening to the debate so far and from knowing what I do about her, I think it's what I think as well, which is what we have in common is the things that we care about. And what we care about fundamentally, and what I think we're all here to, uh, to work on in this place, is our families and our communities and our country and our common humanity. And we have all sorts of different expressions uh, of those affections and those attachments, but those are really what life's about. And I just wanted to make the, I hope not too politically partisan point, that while we might agree that these are the things that matter, we don't necessarily agree on how to fulfil these obligations, how to serve these affections. And in a sense, that's what this argument's about. But the fundamentals are the same. These are the things that matter. We, we serve a common set of ideals and obligations. And I look forward in a friendly way to debating with the Honourable Lady about how on earth we can uh, strengthen our families, strengthen our communities and our country across this House. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Abedin of Polnitsari. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow my, um, on, the Honourable Member. As the current Chair of the Labour Women's Network, it's an honour for me to rise today to pay tribute to Jo Cox, the first ever elected Chair of Labour Women's Network. I'd also like to thank my Honourable, mem honourable Friends for Bermondsey and Old Southwark for securing this special debate. I speak today, despite the fact that I did not know Jo personally, from hearing friends speak, I regret this considerably. Jo led the Labour Women's Network from 2011 until her election to Parliament in 2015. Jo is remembered by our organisation as an activist, a feminist, a humanitarian, a friend, a parent, a politician 
a leader and a doer. Crucially, Jo is remembered as a sister. Most importantly, a sister to my honourable friend, for Batley and Spen, who made an enormously moving and passionate speech. And I know that she'll be a fantastic um, representative in this place. Yeah. Um, jo embodied sisterhood in all women, to women she knew, who feel, still feel echoes of her straight talking support and guts, gutsy humour encouraging them, but also to women like me, whom she, she had never met, meet, or who's on her path she eagerly sought to turn gender equality on its head. The Jo I hear about from late LWN colleagues was proudly political and a proud intersectional feminist. Her sisterhood embraced in all um, diversity. Apologies. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I myself stand before you as part of Jo's legacy as the first black chair of the Labour Women's Network and part of the Parliamentary Labour Party, which is 51% female. Yeah. 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 Having spoken to many of Jo's friends, I suspect they say that Jo would only pause to applaud that historic achievement for a moment before rolling up her sleeve and urging the rest of the house to crack on and catch up. <laughs> <laughs> jo herself said one of the reasons that I'm entering politics is because only 23% of the House of Commons is female, and if women don't make that 50-50 then people take decisions about our communities are never going to be reflective of the needs. The House is now 34% women. This should be noted as part of Jo's legacy, but I'm sure we can still fear her patience for speedier change. Mm -hmm. In the spirit, the Labour Party and the LWN created that Jo Cox Women in Leadership Scheme, on which I was a trainer. It has offered intensive personal and political development to almost 175 women from every region of the UK. Among them are train drivers, firefighters and carers. The youngest participant was 18, the oldest mid-60s. 30% were women of colour, 20% were disabled and 25% were LGBT. They include Shay Akawewo, founder of Unstoppable Digital Self-Care Campaign Glitch, Bex Bailey, named Times Magazine Person of the Year for her role in the Me Too movement, and the award-winning sound engineer, Olga Fitz Fitzroy. The scheme uses Joe's own approach of tough love and hard work to inspire an army of fe feminist change workers. We remind participants that Joe too hit setbacks and made mistakes, faced abuse and wavered, but nevertheless, she persisted, and in Joe's name, ultimately 300 women graduates of the scheme will likewise, likewise persist. Mm -hmm. Few women graduate from the scheme without internalising the voice of its architect, Nan Sloan, reminding them mm -hmm. to get into the room, take up the space, take politics seriously, and never apologise for yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also want to take the opportunity to thank our hard-working officers, Claire Reynolds and Jane Higgy, and the rest of the Executive Committee. The alumni of the programme includes the Honourable Member for Birmingham, Edgbaston, now the Shadow Secretary of State for International Development, and the Honourable Member for Canterbury, now the Chair of the Women's Parliamentary Labour Party. These are all roles in which, had things been different, we, would, we could well have seen Jo taken on herself. We hope that she'll be proud to see the graduates of the Leadership Scheme ably carrying the batons. Madam Deputy Speaker, as the years pass, Joe's colourful legacy continues to grow brighter. We see it in the Joe Cox Foundation, which leaves incredible work in her name. We see it in her amazing children. And we see it in every glass ceiling smashed, every gesture of sisterhood, and every act of brave persistence from generations of women she has inspired. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Ms. Hey. Hey. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, I wasn't sure if I was going to be speaking today, which is why I'm not dressed appropriately, so forgive me for my um, attire. I would have worn far more appropriate trousers, but I felt I, I had just had to contribute. Um, the, the member for Batman Spen gave a splendid speech. I'm incredibly anxious that she wants us all to get fit. She'll realise in this place, fitness, whether it's physical or mental, isn't promoted in any way whatsoever. Um, but I must put on record that the member for Batley and Spen is already doing wonderful work. She has already reached out to me 
and ask what support she can provide all members in this House in helping Afghan men, women and children to be extracted out of Afghanistan. So the member for Battle in Spain is already considering what she can do within her capacity and the power that she has in supporting the most marginalised. I'm not sure what more I can add um, in, in reference to Joe that hasn't already been said because I agree with everything that's been said so far. But I think two things should be put on the record. And maybe they haven't been mentioned because these two skill sets are normally promoted by the men in the house, not normally the women. But Jo was just a natural born leader. Her ability to deal with the, the smallest problem in a constituency and also in the same day deal with the biggest problem on the international stage is incredibly rare for a person to do, but she, she could do that. And, and Jo didn't mind who she worked with if she could achieve her end game. And her end game was always giving the voice to the voiceless and always ensuring those that are overlooked have, are represented in this place and are represented internationally as well. And the other thing we don't talk about often when it comes to women is how clever they are. But Jo was just intelligent. She really was. She could speak on so many issues that mattered so much and would, and her voice would have been so relevant over the last few months in this place. But she was just clever. And the local stuff, the transport stuff, the pothole stuff, the food bank stuff, the international stuff, the terrorism stuff, um, the humanitarian stuff, you know, stuff around issue, issues around China, Russia, the Middle East. She just knew, knew so much. And quite often it's very difficult as a woman to come across cleverer and also to ensure that people will still work with you. And Jo had the skill to do that. Um, jo and I had um, a few, few difficult run-ins. We often did media together. I was obviously on the other side of the TV screen or next to the presenter but we always came off in a positive way had a hug and um, talked about what we're going to work on next and just as my, my neighbor has done so much tremendous work in Afghanistan and I believe that Joe would have been proud we worked together on, on, on genocide and the trade bill and no doubt that she would have been one of the strongest vo voices on that amendment too I just want to say that Joe had a huge impact on both sides of the house and although that she is forgotten, uh, forgive me, although that she's gone, she will never, never be forgotten. And on the rare occasion, when Jo brought us all together, it's important to note that it just takes one strong individual to achieve so much in a short period of time. And I uh, hope that we can remember that as we deal with far more difficult issues going forward. So I just want to put on record my thanks and her family must and should always remain incredibly proud. Thank you. Yeah. Anne McLaughlin. Oh. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, despite being elected on the same day as Joe Cox, I cannot say that I knew her. I knew who she was, and in the months after she died, I almost felt I did know her. I certainly felt I should have known her, but I didn't. However, I, I wanted to be here today, along with my friend and colleague, the Honourable Member for Glasgow Central, to pass on the love, best wishes and solidarity from my party to her friends and family and the communities who no doubt still grieve her loss. We are far more united and have far more in common with each other than things that divide us. It's worth repeating. That, of course, was what Jo said in her maiden speech, and she was right. I share Jo Cox's positivity about human beings and their capacity for humanity, but it's not always easy to stay positive about that. And she's one of the people I always think of if ever I start to feel cynical. I think also of the late Bashir Ahmed, who was the first Muslim member of the Scottish Parliament and only ever saw good in people. I think of my late maternal grandmother, Sarah Purdy, who shared everything she had with whoever needed it for whatever reason and judged nobody. And I do, I think, of Joe Cox. They all believed in the goodness of people, and so should we, because we will achieve more by reaching out to demonstrate what we have in common than by turning away. And whilst we're reaching out, we do, of course, have to keep ourselves safe, and that is one of her legacies. We all take our personal safety and that of our support teams a lot more seriously. This place takes it more seriously. We are all safer now because of Joe Cox. And let's not forget, it's not just MPs and their teams. It's all elected members, including councillors who face unacceptable abuse and threats. They deserve to be safe too. Jo sadly wasn't safe and she paid a terrible price for her beliefs. But I think we should try not to remember her as a victim, although of course she was. Certainly though, when I hear her name, I picture her not as a victim, I picture her as a kind of warrior woman, confident, strong, principled and fearless. 
And yes, I know she had many more battles she would have wanted to fight on behalf of other people, but she probably fought more in her almost 42 short years than most people will ever do. And I imagine that she would rather be remembered for that than have her memory defined by someone representing the wickedness in the world that she spent her time fighting. Finally, I will turn to the Honourable Member for Batley and Spen. I'm not going to look at her because um, <laughs> she's going to get me going. And she is the real reason that I didn't race up the road to Glasgow last night, as I usually do at the first opportunity. I wanted to offer her support, solidarity and sisterhood for the road that she has embarked upon. Most of us had no idea what we were letting ourselves in for. She's come into this with her eyes wide open, Madam Deputy Speaker, having experienced the very worst of elected politics so close up, and still, still she put herself forward. That takes courage. It takes courage and a certain element of steely determination, something she clearly shares with her sister. Her speech today, uh, well, there was so much that I could say about her speech today, but I'm just going to pick up on one thing. It was a wonderful speech. It was what a maiden speech should be and wide-ranging, but I'm just going to pick up on one thing that I really loved, and it's the way she says the name of her constituency, Batley. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, but she never says Batley. She says she puts the battle into Batley, and it's wonderful to hear. But her speech today and the way in which she conducted herself in the days and months after Joe's death, and the way she handled what looked like a pretty nasty by-election. And, and incidentally, as a member of the SNP, I want her to know that I cheered out loud when her result <laughs> came through. <laughs> These things all demonstrate that she is more than Joe's sister, and that she will be a formidable member of this House in her own right. And I wouldn't dream of telling her what to do, but I do want to say that However she wants to approach this role is exactly how she should approach it. If she wants to spend her entire time in here doing what Joe would have done, that's not a bad shout. But she's already let us know that she wants to plough her own furrow, and that is also a good thing. I feel sure I won't be the only one saying that to her. And I do hesitate because I don't, we don't know each other, so who am I to give advice? But I just want her to know that she is her own person. She won that by-election because she is Kim Leadbeater. She should be every bit as proud of herself for that as she is proud of her sister and her sister's wonderful legacy. Ambos Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There are very few backbench MPs who will have a lasting legacy and after they left Parliament, but Joe Cox is one of those people. Uh, I never knew Joe, uh, but from the fondness with which she's remembered by colleagues, I know that she epitomised all that is goodness and inspired us to be kinder to each other and care about everyone in our communities. And on the issue of communities, uh, I campaigned for my honourable friend, the member for Batley and Spen, uh, and it was quite clear that she was everywhere in the community. I even met somebody who'd been to her gym classes who was still willing to vote for her. Uh, and, uh, and that shows what an amazing person she was and what a fantastic presence she had in the, in the communities. <laughs> One area of work that I know uh, Joe Cox was passionate about was tackling loneliness. And the Joe Cox Commission about combating loneliness was one of the first things that I got involved with when I became a newly elected MP in June 2017. It was led by my honourable friend, the member for Leeds West, and the former member for South Ribble, Seema Kennedy, and the Commission sought to start a conversation about loneliness, which would lead to a less lonely and more connected world. And this, is, this work is absolutely crucial and it's more relevant than ever. Yesterday I had the pleasure of meeting some of the COVID bereaved families and listening to their stories about lost family members and loved ones. There was a woman who told me about the physical and mental impact of losing family members, which was then compounded by the loneliness she experienced as a result of various lockdowns. Another told me the inadequacies of bereavement support services. And I'm sure that we all know people who've struggled through loneliness during the pandemic and in bereavement. And the way our communities rallied round to support each other and those struggling during the pandemic is exactly the spirit that Joe Cox was talking about when she said that we all had more in common than that which divides us. Loneliness affects many older people. Age UK states that around 10% of people aged over 65 say they're chronically lonely, with 1.7% or 200,000 saying that they've not had a conversation with a family member for over a month. 
Carers also experience loneliness, with Carers UK estimating that 8 out of 10 carers are fe feeling lonely or isolated as a result of looking after a loved one. And the impact of loneliness is even more profoundly felt by refugees, and as many would have been separated from their families and loved ones who fled war or persecution. As well as making the artist's journey to get to the UK, they will have that loss to experience as well. And that's why family reunion is so essential in these cases and something we should all be championing uh, as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The health impact of loneliness is well documented and it's been estimated that in chronic cases to have the equivalent harmful effect of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And lonely people are also more likely to have mental health conditions such as anxiety and depression. And loneliness is also associated with high cardiovascular disease and strokes. And these are all issues that were raised by the Joe Cox Loneliness Commission. And I'm pleased that the government not only produced a strategy, but even appointed a Minister for Loneliness. And that is quite remarkable, bearing in mind the, um, there are so many things that uh, we debate, but very few things actually happen. That's one of the positives that has come out of uh, uh, Joe's legacy. Meaningful relationships are a key to solving loneliness. And starting conversation is something that we can all look to do as a first step. There's still much work that needs to be done to heal the, uh, the divisions in our society, but with initiatives such as the Great Get Together, and I think I need to get invited to Old Southwark and Bermondsey to go to the, the, the many that my little friend uh, attends. Um, uh, many of, of the uh, Great Get Together uh, being spearheaded by the Joe Cox Foundation, it's clear to me that Joe's legacy in bringing people together will be long lasting. And as this debate has shown, Joe Cox was the best of us and will continue to be an inspiration to us all. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Rosie Duffield. Yeah, um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a real pleasure to follow the new member for Batman's Ben in her incredibly moving maiden speech. Um, the fact that she won on my birthday was just a great birthday present. <laughs> I wasn't lucky enough to know Jo or to be able to call her a friend. However, she had a direct effect on my life that I'd love to be able to thank her for in person. We all remember where we were when we heard the terrible news that day. Just the shock and disbelief and watching the news over and over again, hoping that the headline would somehow change and desperate, desperately willing for it not to be true. Then, a few months later, an announcement at Labour Party conference that one of Joe's legacies would be to help women like me, members of the party who wanted to progress as councillors, activists, or maybe even one day follow in Joe's footsteps and stand as MPs. The Joe Cox Women in Leadership scheme was launched, and I applied at midnight on the deadline day, as always, <laughs> and didn't expect to hear anything back, but at least I tried. Fast forward a couple more months and there was a little bit of a buzz on social media. Women I knew of had started to talk about checking their inboxes. It emerged that a couple of thousand women had applied for approximately 50 places. There was no way on earth that I was going to get one of them. So my poor mum was on the verge of calling an ambulance when she got a snotty, sobbing and totally incoherent phone call from her daughter who'd found an email from Labour Women's Network in her spam folder with an offer of a place on the scheme. Women like me and nobody struggling to raise my boys whilst working part-time as a teaching assistant and filling every other minute with running my local branch of the Labour Party don't often get breaks like this. It was my Charlie Bucket moment. I'd found my golden ticket. Joe's gift to me was a group of women from across the UK, 55 sisters, all with different strengths, backgrounds, experiences, and all with different reasons for applying to the scheme. I've made lifelong friendships with some incredibly special women, all of whom have made an impact. We had had just two of our training sessions when the SNAP election was announced in 2017. I had sat with the member for Camberwell and Peckham in a hotel bar, told her that I was thinking I might practice standing as an MP in 2020 in an area that she knew well. We joked that it was never, ever, in a million years, possible for Canterbury to be anything other than the safest conservative, conservative seat in England. So with absolutely nothing to lose, I practiced standing in 2017, with that brilliant <laughs> group of women there on my phone 24-7. Ten of those women stood for Parliament in 2017, and two of us got here, the first woman ever to represent Canterbury, and the first Sikh woman ever to be elected, my great friend, the member for Birmingham, Ed Edgbaston. Yeah. Those other women have all kept making a difference, 
to continuing to stand for Parliament, becoming councillors, community leaders, leaders of NGOs, activists, union pioneers, women on the front line of the public sector and the fight against the COVID pandemic. Women like Michelle Langham, who leads the Paper Cup project in Liverpool to help to change the lives of Ross sleepers in her region. Dr Kindi Sandu, Coventry City Councillor, academic extraordinaire and activist. Caroline Penn, formidable former Brighton councillor. Dr Alison Gardner, AI ceiling breaker as a leading woman in a traditionally male strand of academia. Denise Christie, firefighter and regional secretary of the FBU. Anna Smith, deputy leader of Cambridge City Council. Salma Arif, first female British Asian health lead on Leeds City Council. And our much missed sister, Asia Shah, who we sadly lost at the end of last year while she was working as a hospital chaplain caring for those with COVID. I wish I could read all of the names of those women, not just some on the first cohort of the scheme with me, but the outstanding women I've met who continue to inspire and change lives for the better in their communities and the wider world. All of us owe our thanks to Jo, not just for the incredible opportunity her legacy has given us, but for the lead she took and the work she did for humanitarian causes around the world and the women who undoubtedly would be worse off if she hadn't shone a light on their needs. Mm -hmm. I was inspired by Jo's passionate commitment to stop Brexit and her humanity and compassion excuse me, for displaced people seeking asylum. And I am certain that she would stand here today and make her views heard on the idea of sending people in boats back to direct harm. Mm -hmm. Jo talked about what we have in common, and that is something that inspires me every single day of my life. One thing I've had in common with Jo is our friendship with a member for Bermondsey and Old Southwark, who has always been a great support, an encourager, a joker, and a fantastic ally. Thanks to him for securing this debate today so that we can remember Jo and to thank her for the real difference she brought to so many lives. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's an honour to speak in this debate and follow the member, the honourable, my honourable friend, the member for Canterbury. Like her, I wasn't lucky enough to know Jo, but her work, Jo's work, has touched the lives of many in my constituency and myself as well. And I would also like to thank the member for Bermondsey and Old Southwark for securing this important debate. I'd like to start by thanking and welcoming the recently elected member for Batley and Spend Parliament and thank her for a powerful maiden speech. And can I just say it was an absolute pleasure to come up to Batley and to support such a relentlessly positive, optimistic and outward looking campaign. Remembering Jo and honouring her legacy is not something that we must do with words just once a year at a debate. It must be with our actions in our work every day as well. Jo championed many important causes, like refugee aid, fighting loneliness, internationalism, and empowering women and girls, to name just a few. On that note, I would like to focus on Jo's work on combating loneliness and how we can continue her work today. Loneliness is an issue that does not discriminate based on age, gender, background or ethnicity. It is often debilitating, damaging to our mental health and can affect us all equally. Almost from the beginning of Jo's parliamentary career, Jo works to bring to light the causes and effects of loneliness so that we may better understand and tackle it. She co-established a cross-party loneliness commission with Seema Kennedy to do just that. This commission brought together 13 organisations to highlight the scale of loneliness across all areas of society and at different stages in everyone's life. It is partially because of the awareness of this commission brought to, it's partly because of the awareness this commission brought to loneliness and mental health more broadly that the issues of loneliness receives greater consideration and resources today. But it, there is still much work to be done. And the Joe Cox Foundation, which campaigns relentlessly to combat loneliness, cannot do it alone. In my own patch of Coventry Northwest, we have seen grassroots community groups work to ensure 
then no one in my community feels alone. During the pandemic, as we're all social, socially distancing, loneliness and men, poor mental health became a more pressing issue. So these groups stepped up to stop the spread of loneliness. The whole Brooks Community Centre in my constituency has organised many community events and provides a safe space for residents to come together and socialise. And the Grapevine Group in Coventry has done so much to stamp out isolation and to support vulnerable people, planning events like socially distant gatherings at our local parks. And with our high streets and town centres struggling, the government must look at more innovative ways to empower groups like these. They must also look at how we can better support community pubs, repurpose community and disused buildings and make our green spaces more accessible to combat isolation and loneliness. My constituency of Coventry North West will certainly welcome this support. And Madam Deputy Speaker, I am incredibly grateful to be able to honour Jo and her work and to speak on such an important issue. Thank you. Sharon Hodgson. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, and it's an honour to um, follow the Honourable Member for Coventry North West. Um, but obviously I would like to start um, by thanking um, my Honourable Friend, the Member for Bermondsey and All Southwark, and the Honourable Lady for Chatham and Aylesford for securing this very important debate today. And also next, um, I want to congratulate the wonderful, um, honourable friend, the member for Batley and Spen. It is, as others have said, fantastic to be able to say that yeah. um, on her excellent, indeed sublime um, maiden speech yeah. today. Yeah. And I have no doubt that my friend will go on to do um, great things. And I'm so excited to be able to watch and I hope help her in any way that I can. No one knew Joe better, and that love and admiration has shone through today. And I know that Joe would have been very proud, as indeed her whole family rightly are. And sadly, we all remember hearing the news on that horrific day in June 2016, and then the conversations that followed with friends and family, and particularly for MPs with our children. Joe's children, Coolin and Layla, were very much younger than mine, but I have no doubt that children of MPs like mine, Joseph and Emily, who kiss goodbye to their mum or their dad when they head off to a regular constituency day, were all united that day, both in fear for their parents' safety, but also the heartbreak, love and understanding for Joe's children. And I've always reassured my family, as I'm sure we all do, that I'm safe in my work. And although those weeks and months after Joe's murder were difficult for everyone who knew Joe in so many ways, I know we have all been comforted by Joe's words that we all know so well. We are far more united and have far more in common than that which divides us. And Joe put those words into action. And like me, as we've heard, she was a pragmat pragmatic idealist. <laughs> and like me also, um, she believed in cross-party working. And um, any advice on setting up APPGs on your girl? <laughs> because I truly believe in order for something to succeed, it has to be done with the support of colleagues across the political spectrum and across the House. And anyone who knows me in this place will know I stand by that word. So Jo did that, though, soon after becoming an MP, she knew and she set up the Cross-Party Loneliness Commission also with the former member for South Ribble. And I'm proud of my honourable friend, the member for Leeds West, who was able to continue Joe's work in this important issue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And loneliness isn't just a problem for the elderly, as the honourable member for Chatham and Aylesford referred to in her excellent contribution. And as I discovered when my daughter went off to university, where although surrounded by many young people, she was desperately lonely and felt very isolated for the first few months. So I would add students to the, the list that the Honourable um, Lady cited earlier. And the Joe Cox Loneliness Commission found evidence, as we've heard from my Honourable Friend, the Member for Enfield Southgate, 
can um, adversely affect your health. So it is indeed a public health issue that we all need to take seriously. And I'm sure that Joe would have been working throughout the pandemic um, to, amongst other things, as we heard from the lady opposite, um, keep people connected and help tackle loneliness, as I know the Joe Cox Foundation has been doing. And as the then Shadow Minister for Veterans, I asked the former uh, Veterans Minister, the Honourable Member for Plymouth Moor View, last December, to support and promote the Joe Cox's Foundation's great winter get-together um, for veterans. And I am very pleased to say that we were then both able to attend a very large virtual roundtable discussion with um, hundreds of veterans, I think it was, hosted by the fabulous Joe Cox Foundation and the Royal British Legion with veterans. Um, and that was just at the beginning of this year. It was excellent in February, I recall. So as we've heard, Joe achieved so much in such a short space of time as an MP, and we will never know what might have been, but I'm confident it would have been magnificent. Mm. Mm -hmm. And Joe's legacy lives on in the organisations, charities and work that continues in her name. And through the Joe Cox Women in Leadership programme, we are seeing more women who love and act like Joe enter politics, like my honourable friend who we've heard about, the member for Birmingham, Edge Baston, and my wonderful honourable friend, the member for Canterbury. And we are all the better for it. It is an honour to sit under the Joe Cox Memorial plaque, as well as a heartbreak, as a reminder of the impact that she had across the ch chamber and indeed across the world. And it's our duty to ensure that Joe is remembered and that that legacy lives on, which on days like today, I am confident that it will. Thank you. Yeah. SNP spokesperson, Alison Thewlis. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I would, as well as everybody else has done, like to thank the, the members for Bermondsley and Old Southwark and Chatham and Aylesford for bringing this debate today. Um, it's been incredibly moving uh, for everybody. And I know that we all do remember where we were, what we were doing uh, when that news came through. I was coming back from a, a surgery myself and couldn't believe that this could happen to anybody and certainly not that it could have happened to Joe. And I was reflecting and thinking of this this week of, of the day when we all came back here and the memorial and the tributes that were paid and how we, how we all felt that day as well. Um, sitting there, I was sitting there up the back and couldn't take my eyes off um, Brendan and Cool and Leila up in the, in the chamber. There were those tiny wee bits of children and to feel so, so awful for them about what had happened. But I think what we all can agree that we all think of them, we all keep them in their hearts, and that they would be incredibly proud of the legacy that their mum has had and the things that she has done, and that we still hear today in this place that so many of us have come to remember her and to thank her um, for what she has done. And it's interesting that this, this House does remember her often and speaks of her often. And I noticed in the, the library briefing that was sent round, because um, I, I had tried to search this myself and couldn't quite do it, so I'm glad that they had, that the library says that that her name uh, had been mentioned 129 occasions in this parliament, uh, just in this, this session since the election, um, and prior to today, obviously, which is, is many more mentions. And that really does reflect that while she may not be in here, she is always with us and always in our thoughts. And I think that is important. And that leg legacy, of course, has brought us here. It's brought us here in emotion and in love and in solidarity with one another. And I think keeping those values is very important too. And we welcome uh, her sister, the new member for Black Battle and Spain, who has already achieved so much in being here and coming here. And we look forward very much to seeing uh, what she will do in this place for her constituents, the causes she will champion and the things that she will do. And she will do her constituents very proud, I am sure. And my honourable member from Glasgow North, my honourable friend from Glasgow North East, was, was absolutely right to say that we all cheered um, to see you elected. It's unusual, um, I suppose, that we would do that, but the context uh, is, is very different. We were delighted, particularly with the awfulness of some of that campaign, um, that you got through that, that, that and that you're here with us uh, and in this place. It's a, an absolute joy for democracy and, and for the values that we all share. And the, the mentions uh, of the Joe Cox Foundation, I think, it hasn't been talked about enough, I don't think. Lots of people have mentioned it. I just wanted to mention you know, some of those uh, things that are done 
by the Foundation, the great get-togethers, which uh, I've been to and I've enjoyed, the More in Common Network, the, the Connection Coalition, which I think is, is really important as well, the, the very local Yorkshire projects as well, which stand to, as a local legacy to our work. The work around civility and politics, was actually, which is actually so important that we find ways to, um, to agree respectfully, to find ways to disagree respectfully, to work with one another where there are common causes uh, and across political divides wherever possible. And the, the international work has been mentioned by many uh, of the, the Joe Cox Memorial Grants through the FCDO, uh, more valuable today uh, with the situation in Afghanistan than they have ever been. The work on loneliness that was mentioned as well is incredibly important and I thought it was very interesting the reflection about the widening of that scheme, um, the widening of that concept uh, that Joe took to it and I know from speaking to many of the refugee groups within my con constituency how much that lonely, loneliness work has meant to them to have their pain recognised, to have that isolation recognised and to take positive steps to try and change that uh, and to make that right. And I want to reflect a little bit on um, some of the things that were said about uh, the, the Labour Party uh, from a Scottish Labour perspective. And I, I did my best to, to reach out across political divides and contacted uh, Labour MSPs who, and former MSPs who I thought would have something that they wished to say on that. I wanted to make sure that her legacy in Scotland was also recognised too. And my predecessor, Anna Sarwar, a now MSP uh, for Glasgow, uh, held, I uh, organised a great get-together event and very charitably, given the circumstances in which uh, he and I know one another, uh, <laughs> invited me along to that as well. He had no obligation to do so, but he reached out across that uh, party political divide and organised a wonderful event at his constituency office which brought the community get together, which allowed people to have those conversations uh, and to be together. And I hope that we'll be able to make uh, that happen more in the years and months to come. And I also reached out to uh, Kezia Dugdale, a uh, former uh, leader of Scottish Labour, and a, a very good egg, I would say, um, we're now working for the, the John Smith uh, Foundation at Glasgow University. And Kez was Scottish Labour leader at the time at which Joe was taken from us. And she reflected, uh, as the honourable member for Ellison Thamesmead also mentioned, about Joe, the power of Joe's sisterhood. And she described Joe, uh, Kez described Joe as the ultimate feminist, lifting up women, giving her time to mentor people and to open doors. And she felt that the, the Joe Cox Women in Leadership programme that the Labour Party has is that fitting tribute. Uh, she says, as, re as reflected by others who have spoken on Women for Canterbury, also um, that it's a, a fitting tribute because it's about political education, but also helping women organise and, and, prepa and prepare for life and politics. And far be it for me to commend uh, that women go into the Labour Party, but it does sound <laughs> like a very good scheme and a very meaningful legacy. Um, and Kez said, uh, particularly, she says, for me and many women like me, Joe's legacy was about supporting women to realise their own power and agency to affect change. And I think we can all agree that that's definitely something for whatever party you want to stand for, uh, something worth valuing. Mm -hmm. And I also heard uh, from Monica Lennon, MSP, who she says, um, who I understand has had the meeting, has had the privilege of meeting the, the new member from Batley in Spain uh, at events also, and she also is very delighted uh, for you here today. And she reflected the power and essence of Joe's legacy in bringing our, in our diverse communities together, people from different parties, people from different backgrounds, in, in a space where we can chat and, uh, and be together. And her feeling was also of solidarity. And she says, women of all political parties have looked out for one another more since Joe's death, and that is and that we can all take inspiration from the way that she lived her life. And I think that is incredibly powerful, regardless of, of whoever has said these things. And I thank uh, those, member, those colleagues in the Scottish Labour Party for getting in touch with me to, uh, to do that as well, because they also miss her and thank her for all that she has done. And I think, in reflecting the, the, the legacy of those who have come here in this place as Joe's, um, uh, as Joe's legacy, um, it's really important and it reminds us in all of our qualities, you know, what we should be, how we should approach things. And I wrote down some of the words that people had mentioned, passion, enthusiasm, commitment, clarity, decency, principle, being a campaigning MP in whatever aspect that takes, the humanitarian, the commonality of cause with one another, bringing that voice to the voiceless, being intelligent and being proud of that, uh, humanity and seeing the goodness in people. All of these are qualities we should seek 
in members of parliament. They are all those qualities that we recognise, that the public recognises, but we should talk about them more as a way to bring people into this place who have those qualities and to make our politics better. And I also wanted to take just a small second to thank all the people that have spoken so far and to say to them all, because we don't say it enough, how much I appreciate them, how much I like them, and how much I thank them um, for being in this place, for sharing this, this strange world we all inhabit. Um, because we don't do that enough when we have the chance. So I think I want to, just to close on that, to thank everybody who's spoken, to say my, my appreciation to Joe's family who are here and her friends, uh, and to wish everybody the very best and what has been a very difficult day uh, for so many of us. Thank you. Shadow Minister Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I thank my honourable friend, the member for Bermondsey and Old Southwark, for not only securing today's debate, but opening it with such an important reminder of not just what we have lost, but as all honourable members have said today, what we have gained from the life of Joe. Mm -hmm. And I thank all who have attended, whether they've spoken or sat here and reflected, your presence means so much to us. Today we have searched for words to show our affection and admiration for our dear friend Jo. Her legacy has left its imprint around the world, and in contrast to the dark moment that stole her life, the light through which she lived her life and shared with others has ignited hope, lit movements, and sparked a generation of people to step into a space where they too can make change, make a difference to the people around them. The Honourable Member for Batley and Sped has more than stepped into that space today in her own unique way. Yeah, yeah. In one of the most personal and passionate speeches ever heard in this House, she has moved us all, or certainly will, with her, one of her workouts. <laughs> As a younger sister myself, I recognise that unique bond between sisters. And today, the Leadbeater family spirit filled this chamber. Just as the memorable words of Joe's maiden speech called us to draw together through recognising the unity we share, overwhelming that which divides us, today's speech by my honourable friend will echo not just in this place, but across nations in years to come. Indeed, today it sparked unity in our place and perhaps a fresh start for politics to bring us more together to do the job we were called to do. But it was these powerful words, first spoken by Joe, that have called time and again on our communities to draw close, to seek to find our common bonds and beckon for us to share our lives in unique ways with each other. Joe did. As so many of us recently witnessed in Batley and Spen, Joe's legacy is sown into the hearts she touched in her own community. As we knocked on doors, people were eager to share how Joe had been there for them spoke for them, and above all, turned those words into actions. She knew the honour of being sent to Parliament to speak for them, a task she diligently devoted herself to. As we have heard today, she reached out across the House to draw people into her space and turn their attention to the cause. Whether on Syria and highlighting the acute humanitarian crisis, or whether her compassion in listening to those who have known the searing pain of loneliness. I thank my honourable friend, the member for Wirral South as well, for all she has done in continuing Joe's work on Syria, in putting the victims of conflict at the heart of all we do. It is her tenacity which has furthered Joe's legacy. Joe sought answers, laboured for solutions, and focused on the transformation she believed politics could bring. As the member for Aberavon reminds us, she strived for unity over division, to stand up for what was right, speaking truth to power. As my humble friend, the member for Barnsley Central, who can't be with us today, wanted to pay this tribute. Jo was such a good friend and wonderful human being, compassionate, kind, honest, funny, courageous. She was a doer with an infectious enthusiasm. Jo's legacy as a humanitarian shines strong and her memory will continue to inspire for generations to come. We miss her dearly. Jo, of course, spent time working in the EU, and there, too, her legacy continues. As the chair of the Labour Party, the Honourable Member for Oxford East said, 
Joe's legacy is keenly felt by so many people with the Socialist and Democrat group and reflected in the naming of her own square in Brussels, plus Joe Cox. Joe's message continues to be a rallying cry for a grown-up politics which promotes the incredible things people can achieve when they come together. In those words, more in common, which we daily read and remind ourselves at the start of each session and draw perspective from as we look to the coat of arms placed above these benches. We, we embrace those words that we must have more in common. As my honourable friend, the member for Hornsey and Wood Green, who can't be here right now, said when in the chamber, I looked at Joe's plaque and think how I can make a positive contribution the way Joe did, inclusive, warm, intelligent and challenging. Joe's, Joe lives on in our contributions both to address our, at times, divided communities, always with a sense of urgency and hope. It was to communities here and around the world that Joe served. Having seen the difference the Royal Voluntary, Ser Vol Royal Voluntary Service was making to the lives of older and vulnerable people in her constituency, she became determined to tackle the issue of loneliness. Joe's support to ensure no one of any age from any background experienced loneliness led to the Commission on Loneliness and the subsequent strategy and a named Minister for Loneliness. And I have to say it's such a pleasure to see the Honourable Member for Chatham and Ellsford back in the Chamber today. Yeah. It's her legacy which has moved this agenda forward as the Commission turned into that strategy and in October this year it will mark its third anniversary. So it's important, its importance was noted by us all over the last 18 months as we have navigated our way through the COVID-19 pandemic. And it isn't without significance that my honourable friends, the member for Enfield, Southgate, Coventry Northwest, Washington and Sunderland West have all drawn on that as the feature of their speeches today, recognising its role amongst the bereaved, amongst those who have really been challenged in our times, those people experiencing chronic loneliness, and of course, at this time, refugees too. My hon honourable friend, the member for Irith and Thamesmead, reminded us all of the inspiration she gave us as women, not least through the Labour's Women's Network. And my honourable friend, the member for, for Canterbury, talked of the power of the women in leadership. Jo's feminism came through in all she did, whether on the international stage or in her constituency. The Jo Cox Foundation, found in her memory, formed by friends and family, is growing Jo's legacy with a vision for a kinder, more compassionate society where every individual has a sense of belonging. It now marks the great get-together, bringing communities together, and I look forward to my invite to Bermondsey <laughs> next year to join with colleagues in that place of unity. <laughs> Alongside the More in Common Network, the Connection Coalition, Civility in Politics, Building a Fairer World, and Local Projects in Yorkshire itself, the Joe Cox Foundation is certainly advancing Joe's legacy. Others too wanted to speak words into today's debate and the Freedom Fund for whom Jo worked before coming to Parliament wanted to say this. Jo was a powerful champion for the world's most vulnerable and marginalised. She was one of those rare people who really did fight tirelessly to make the world a better place. And with it all, Jo was warm, funny, fearless and effective. Jo also worked for Oxfam, leaving a significant and far-reaching legacy. She worked on the Make Poverty History campaign to increase aid, cancel debt, improve trade for the world's poorest countries and advocated for the protection of civilians globally. An inspiring, positive and energetic leader who is passionate about justice and equality, Oxfam's vision of a kinder, fairer world, a world less divided by borders, money, race or gender, is rooted in Jo's values. Her work and her impact is still felt across Oxfam and the development sector today. As a passionate advocate here and around the world, it was no mistake that Jo was a Labour MP. Her politics mattered. 
she was an active member of the GMB too. Neil Derrick, the regional secretary, has paid this tribute. Jo radiated happiness and it was infectious. You couldn't help but smile when in her company, as many of us did. She wanted to do so much and had so many plans to try and improve things, not just for her constituents, but for GMB members across the region. A little bit of Joe lives on in every one of us, every time we do a good deed or show compassion to one another. We are incredibly proud at GMB to call Joe one of our own. And as honourable friends have said today, she is one of our own. Joe's search for a fairer and more just world drove her in all she did. At this time of such failed global politics, it would have been Joe not just identifying the challenges, but gathering people to advance solutions, build bridges, and determine a better far path forward. As the Honourable Member for Tombridge and Malling reminded us that Joe showed us what this place was for, the purpose for which we are called to serve, and the Right Honourable Member for Sutton Coldfield saying, and knowing where we stand. Above all, Jo was an extraordinary woman, a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, a colleague, and our friend. In leaving us, she has challenged us all to take up her call and create a far fairer and just world where we have more in common that unites us than which divides us. Yeah. Minister Batwood. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it's an honour to respond for the government in this important debate. And I congratulate the Honourable Member for Bermondsey and Old Southwark for securing it. But I hope the whole House would agree with me that it's right to turn first to the extraordinary speech we heard from the new member, the Honourable Brave Lady for Batley and Spen. She spoke movingly about her journey to this place, what it means to be here, and her passion to diligently represent the area that she loves and that Joe Cox loved too. And if I may, I will pick out two areas specifically. And the first is what she said about public service. Every day in this chamber, we see that for doing this job, some members of parliament made the ultimate sacrifice. We all, one way or another, make sacrifices doing it too, but there are too many shields on these walls. And we all know that parliament this place is where we can make the lives of our constituents and this whole country greater still. And as she said, both her and her sister sought to reach across party lines to do that. We are strongest when we can make that work, when we can crack on and get stuff done, as she said. And in so doing, perhaps we will make the divisive, damaging, fractured politics that we've seen in recent years a little bit less painful. Over the last few years, we've lived through some of the most polarised times in British politics. From the tone of today's debate, I think we all think that we should do better. Mm -hmm. And I know, speaking to members across this House, that Jo Cox worked across party from the moment she was elected. And I know, speaking to the Honourable Lady herself before this debate, that she too will continue that legacy. We have, as so many have said today, more in common than that which divides us wherever we sit in this House. And I think we forget that too often. And the second thing to say, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that while this is a debate not solely focused on the Joe Cox Foundation by any means, uh, it is focused on her legacy as a whole, but the foundation is the way in which we will ensure that so much of that work lives on, Madam Deputy Speaker. Legacies are always about the future, not the past. So those values of stronger communities, a better public life, and a fairer world are all things the last 18 months have certainly shown us to be more vital than ever. Whether that is, as Joe put it herself, turbocharging the public's awareness of loneliness or tackling the scandal of online hate, this government is committed to tackling the issues the Foundation is involved in. And that's because, Madam Deputy Speaker, when she identified them, those issues mattered profoundly and they still matter profoundly. Now, I could, Madam Deputy Speaker, talk at great length about the things that the government is doing to support some of those superb initiatives. They've been mentioned a lot today, whether it's the Joe Cox Memorial Grants, the Foundation's Great Get Together campaign. Collectively, Joe's legacy is already benefiting tens of thousands of people across the world. I'll highlight three particular areas. The first is intimidation in public life and the behaviour that can stop talented people, particularly women, 
and those from minority backgrounds from standing for public office. We recognise that several MPs have in the past referenced abuse as a reason for standing down, and to humanise that, Madam Deputy Speaker, it means that there's hardly a woman in Parliament who hasn't received a death threat, even though many men have not. It means the police judge that we need security in our homes, and it means an emotional toll on our families that, who worry that this job is far more risk than it's worth, as the Honourable Lady for Washington and Sunderland West, the West said. For all those reasons and more, the government is taking action to tackle this culture. And I don't think today is a day to introduce partisan politics, but let me say simply that it is the need to tackle intimidation of every sort that drives the government's agenda from online safety to defending democracy. Second, on loneliness. As Joe said, young or old, loneliness doesn't discriminate. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted, as so many people have today, the importance of social connection for everyone across society. And I pay tribute to the honourable members for Chatham and Aylesford, for Mid-Sussex, and to our former colleague Seema Kennedy for all the work they have done on this. This government is proud to have continued to play our part in building on the pioneering work that Joe Cox started, and the Joe Cox Commission on Loneliness carried out that invaluable work which informed the government's 2018 Tackling Loneliness Strategy, the world's first government strategy of its kind. It evolved into nearly £50 million of investment, the world's first loneliness minister, and I think huge progress in destigmatising an issue on which there remains so much to do. Third, Madam Deputy Speaker, Joe Cox's work had strong roots in her local area. Like Joe, we believe that local people understand what is needed in their communities, be that local and grassroots action on tackling loneliness or on a host of other issues. We can all take action, no matter how small, to reach out with kindness to those around us, and we should never underestimate the huge impact this can have in our communities. I want to turn now to some of the specific contributions made by members, and firstly to the speech from the member for Bermondsey and Old Southwark, who was the first, but by no means the only, to mention the importance of family uh, to Joe and to the Honourable Member for Batley and Spen. It is great that the uh, family join us today in the gallery. There are clearly some formidable genetics up in the gallery, and I worry that there are now some formidable genetics on the opposition benches as well. Um, and also, uh, it was so keen of the Honourable Gentleman to invite us all to Bermondsey for another great get-together. Um, turning specifically to the, the comments on loneliness uh, that the members for Chatham and Aylesford, uh, Coventry Northwest, and Enfield Southgate uh, mentioned, uh, one of uh, the uh, things that the Honourable Lady will, will uh, learn, I suspect, is that uh, Thursday afternoons are a particularly great opportunity for backbenchers to press the government to take action on a host of issues, and she saw a very adept way of doing that from the Honourable Lady. Uh, what she may also learn is that she doesn't always get the straightest and most immediate answer from the government dispatch box. Uh, but the Honourable Lady knows that both the issues she raised is, are, are under serious consideration by this government, and uh, her views are ones that are shared elsewhere. So uh, those two issues, particularly on social prescribing, are hugely valuable. Um, among other things, the Honourable Lady might also learn uh, from the Honourable Gentleman, the Right Honourable Gentleman for Sutton Coalfield, is that it is genuinely true that friendships go across party, and I hope we can continue that. She may also learn that there is no place in which you can't promote a book, but that is a separate <laughs> issue. Um, the Honourable Gentleman for Tunbridge and Morling, uh, no, no longer in his place, uh, adopting, uh, uh, carrying out his duties as chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, made what I think was a genuinely important speech uh, about the value of why we are all here, and I think we all valued that contribution. I think we also can all learn how you can turn being late into a uh, politically useful point as well. Um, the members for Aberavon and Wirral South uh, talked powerfully about the persistent emotional impact of Joe's presence and about her internationalism, and I think we all uh, learnt even more than we have in previous tributes uh, about just what an ongoing impact Joe has had on so many people. Um, to turn briefly to, to other contributions, uh, the Honourable Member for Devizes uh, pointed out the value of debate. That is why we are all here. Uh, the uh, Honourable Members for Erith and Thamesmead and Canterbury talked about the value of the Labour Women's Network, highlighting the progress that has been made in this House and indeed in the Labour Party uh, on improving diversity. We all share those ambitions, and I can think of a couple of Tory Prime Ministers who would definitely agree with them. Uh, the, uh, with the Honourable Member for Wealdon, of course, talked about the value of leadership, which she has shown uh, on uh, a number of issues, and I know will continue to do so. And turning finally to the contributions of the members for Glasgow North East and Glasgow Central, both 
talked about cheering the result in Batley and Spen. And I must confess that it is easier uh, to cheer uh, that result if you are a member of the SNP than if you are a member of the Conservative Party. But that does not mean we cannot celebrate the arrival of the Honourable Lady and all her qualities. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Government is proud to continue the legacy we have discussed today. Whether it is through supporting women and girls internationally through the Joe Cox Memorial Grants, working at national level to address intimidation in public life and tackle loneliness, or supporting people to connect in their local communities, we continue to be inspired by the life and the work of Joe Cox and her belief in a kinder and fairer world for everyone. And I want to end by saying simply one thing. We've heard powerful speeches today watched by honoured guests in the gallery, and I know there are others, including the former Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead, who hope to be here too. Today has been an exceptional parliamentary moment, and that is because we have been here to commemorate an exceptional life. We see that shield in this chamber every day, a pointed reminder that Joe Cox's legacy is permanent in our minds and in this place. I know the member for Batley and Spen will do justice to it, and we should all work to honour it as well. Yeah. Neil Coyle to wind up. Thank you again, Madam Deputy Speaker, and to the House Authorities and the Backbench Business Committee for giving us the chance to pay our respects here in, in the Chamber and to reflect, as the Honourable uh, Member for Will South put it, it's been tough for many of us, uh, and we saw that in the Honourable Member for Amber Evan, and completely understandably tough. But we've also heard what an inspiration Joe remains, as the Honourable Member for Canterbury put it. But all contributions have made clear that Joe's work, her passions, her loves, her values live on through members across this House. And something that's rung throughout the debate, clearly, is the importance of cross-party work, which we've heard from the, is it Royal Sutton Coldfield? Or just Sutton <laughs> Coldfield? Um, uh, but, but also from Washington, also from Washington and, and, and Sunderland West. And, and of course, we wouldn't have had the debate if it wasn't for the cross-party work. And I thank again the Honourable Member for Chapman and Elswood, who talked about Joe's spirit of getting things done. Um, not just raising issue, but getting it sorted, which I think uh, was termed uh, uh, was as a demonstration of the Yorkshire grit that I think we heard about in the in the maiden speech. And what a brilliant maiden speech! An amazing yeah, maiden yeah, speech, yeah, yeah, yeah. and brilliant for the House to be able to give such a warm welcome from across the House, such a warm welcome to the new member uh, for Batley and Spen. Um, and brilliant to hear today how proud, how rightly proud the whole family is of the positive legacy of Joe Cox and going forward we all have a duty to continue Joe's efforts five years on. We could all benefit from being a bit more Joe. Yeah. It would certainly improve some of my uh, social media contributions I think <laughs> but, but, but it's also very clear today Madam Speaker, that from the maiden speech that it's not just Joe's positive legacy that lives on but it's that relentlessly positive family spirit that lives on through the new member for Batley and Spen. And we could all benefit from being a bit more Joe, but we'd certainly all benefit from being a bit more Kim. Yeah, and, and we'll all have the chance to do it when we welcome the Batley Way riders to Flatland Square at the Great Get Together in June next year. Thank you. Well, this has been an incredibly um, moving and thoughtful debate, and it has been a real honour to hear all your extremely um, powerful contributions about Joe's legacy. But many congratulations um, to the Honourable Lady, the member for Batley and Spen. <laughs> she is going to be, I, it is great to welcome another Yorkshire woman to the chamber, by the way. Um, she is going to be an incredibly effective contributor. But I get the feeling she's also going to bring a certain liveliness <laughs> to our debates. So many congratulations um, to her. Um, she's very insightful. With, uh, I was very proud to hear her contribution and wonderful to have your family here as well and I'm sure they share in that pride. Thank you. So, the question is that this House has considered the legacy of Joe Cox. As many as are of that opinion say, I, the contrary, no, I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Thank you.